Hello everyone, I welcome you all to the first workshop, um, which is first speeches um, with respect to the ideal national camp training. Um, we were dealing with how you can make better prime minister and leader of opposition speeches. Um, with that, we started with how you can do, how you can have a better strategy with respect to the first speech, how you can utilize prep time properly and how to resolve clashes. But I'm gonna again, like go, go through each one of it properly so that like the newcomer uh, Navya can also catch up with what we discussed. Then we are also going to discuss how you can predict uh, the arguments when it comes to the first speeches, because essentially when you're prime minister, you're supposed to predict all the arguments that are um, firstly obvious, but also like uh, preemptive rebuttals as well. And then thirdly, I think it's ex extremely necessary for you to paint the picture for the adjudicator um, and how you can essentially paint the picture and then def definition, characterization, the general stuff of what the role of first speeches are. Uh, but then secondly, you can also, uh, see uh, a little bit of identification of stakeholders and prom uh, problems and then impacts and shock levels of speeches. Um, last but not the least, we're also going to discuss the specificity with respect to the rebuttals for the four speeches as well. So we discussed this yesterday when we were talking about how you can have a better strategy for four speeches. And we discussed three things that we need to have. Um, we first need to understand what the debate is about and then predict the arguments and understand the end goals. So when you are in the prep time and when you understand this is the end goal of the debate, it's, it helps you A, to start better framing, but B, um, it makes your debate more linear and your arguments more linear rather than circular because oftentimes in not you identify a problem give the solution and then that, that particular solution of itself has another problem so it just like essentially makes the case uh, very less in terms of um, a convincing ability but also it doesn't really have a good impact on the adjudicators then we discussed this uh, motion which was this house regrets the rise of cancer culture and we discussed as to what the debate is about and how the end goals and what were the most obvious arguments um there were a couple of arguments being given by all of you all, uh, which is there in the other document. But then this one, we uh, had, what is this debate about? This debate can, about, can be about several things. First, about expression on the social media, accountability of the individuals who are expressing on the social media, uh, the call-out culture, culture that exists with respect to trying to make sure that there is specific restriction in, in terms of how people are ex exercising their right to speech, but also uh, who are the specific people who who get the who become the victims of cancel culture in the first place? These are the people who are actors, influencers, public figures who get that much amount of attention and clout, and therefore people are more likely to like uh, cancel them as opposed to like random individual like you and me because we don't really have followers, we don't really have that much clout, we don't really have that much amount of uh, reach as well. The second thing then is the end goal of this particular debate was basically inclusivity of minority groups reformation, healthier social environment, etc. But this particularly is dependent on you as to what you prioritize the prioritize the best. So the end goal is based on whether or not you want or whether or not um, you want a particular thing to be the most important stakeholder of the debate and why and how you achieve that particular stakeholder to exist in the first place. The last thing then is about prediction of the most important arguments. And we discussed about how it could be uh, about a exclusion of minority classes, targeted individuals, as to like how a lot of times when cancer, cancer culture exists, the people who are um, going to decide as to who is essentially cancelled are going to be by, by the mainstream uh, by the mainstream media, the people who have a lot of like um, political uh, for political mobility and political um, identity and cloud as well, which means they're able to like influence a large number of people that look this particular person is essentially bad and this particular person um, should be um, should be some somebody who is uh, um, you know, the enemy of the entire class and stuff like that. So this, um, and then we can talk about how um, it could lead to targeted um, targeted individuals and communities, um, specifically to the minority community. So even if like one person uh, in the community is essentially going ahead and like talking about a particular thing, they're more likely to be the victims of the cancel culture because of the kind of monopoly that exists in these platforms in the first place. Then we talked about um, efficiency of the way of call out. Do you think it is the efficiency of call out? Do you think people are more likely to reform? Do you think people are more likely to have a better discourse uh, when this is the way of call out mechanism? And then we talked about um, how it leads to imp impulsive decisions of individuals because also often and they're not. Um, people are cancelled on social media simply because um, people think that, um, you know, like just, they just hear it from a particular thing and like a large number of people are all just simply cancelled because of false um, news and like fake um, news and rumors, which is essentially bad for the mental health of individuals and so on and so forth. So this essentially brings into the idea of shame rather than like 
making sure that the problem or the root cause is solved. Um, again, this could lead to things like more extremism, and uh, it, this is also principally wrong because it's presumption of guilt rather than presumption of innocence, which is against the principle of justice in the first place. So presumption of guilt is basically like you don't even like know or get to um, have the proper opportunity to see whether the person was actually right or not. Um, you just simply go ahead and say that hashtag we boycott um, XYZ movie and stuff like that. So even without seeing that movie, you would jo just go ahead and like boycott that movie um, based on what you have heard because th these are the things which are impulsive in nature. I hope um, there's no uh, question on this particular thing. Uh, are there any questions? No, no questions. Okay, moving on. Then we talked about how you can have a better prep time. So this is the one that I that I have to start with. So so essentially, when you are into prep time, can you tell me how how many minutes you have in prep time for WSTC? Forty five minutes, I think. Okay, others. Sixty. Um, it does vary to 30 minutes as well, according to the format. Okay. So according to the debate that I've judged in, it's one hour. So um, WSDC has prep time with respect to the impromptu speeches, which is which is uh, one hour. So if you have one hour, you're supposed to have like specific allocation with respect to how you want to uh, deal with the kinds of um, like um, roles that are there. How do you want to like utilize the prep time the most efficiently? The first thing that you need to do is understand what are the questions that are supposed to be answered in the in in the motion of itself, and then go on and see um, like take the ten minutes and understand what could be the assertions and what could be the counter assertions. Assertion. So even if your proposition, your opposition doesn't really matter. Understand, okay, if it is about this house, would allow social media companies from independently deplatforming politicians. What does it look like? What are the questions that are existing? Um, so all of these things are essentially very important when it comes to um, like either side you are in. So ask like, okay, this is what proposition is going to run. This is what opposition is going to run. And this is what, again, uh, going to be the thing that op like proposition is probably going to run. So these are the counter mechanism that you can essentially understand, okay, this is what the, the debate is essentially going to boil down, boil down to. And this is the thing that we're supposed to prioritize more because it's going to give us more leeway over the other. And the third thing then is about what argument. Um, so when you have like in your head, and in the preparation time within the 10 minutes, you have understood that, look, this is what is going to happen uh, with respect to an, uh, assertions and then counter assertions. You understand which is likely to be the uh, argument which is going to have the most impact simply because of several reasons. One, because it has less counter assertions. Second, because it's just difficult for the opposition or the opponent uh, to prove. And then thirdly, um, just because you have more analysis to the argument and, and, and so on and so forth. So just by in within these 10 minutes, you should know all of these things so that you are able to then go ahead and like frame your uh, frame your debate better. Um, the fourth thing then is about identif identification of the winning debate argument. So there are all there is always one argument which you think is going to like make you win the debate if you prove it properly. Um, that's also based on the end goal that you think is that's essentially the end goal of the debate. Uh, so what I would suggest with respect to this is that um, in the first 10 minutes, just do like, like write down every single assertion that is being discussed and then go on and prioritize and see which assertion is the most important assertion or which assertion is something which you want to prioritize over the other because as a first speaker you cannot essentially just deal with all this all, all the arguments what you have to do is like prioritize let's say two arguments or three arguments whichever you think you're going to be able to like um fulfill or like um like satisfy in eight minutes so try to like then prioritize which is the winning debate argument or which is the argument which can have the most uh, likely impact oftentimes or not we just like simply write a lot of assertions but then at the end of the day it's just like um it's just like the linear um, analysis to another argument. I'm going to deal with what is linear dissection of the argument in a little bit, but let's go on to this um, this this motion that we left on. So this house would allow social media companies from independently deplatforming politicians. We talked about how the most obvious argument could be principle of freedom of speech, hate speeches, um, and that's pretty much it. Do you have anything else in terms of what are the most obvious arguments?
probably about the role of let's say advertisements for political campaigns in the very first place that how it becomes so much more essential for these politicians to come ahead and push forward their policies in front of the people but at the very same point is it the power of the social media companies the basic mediators in this entire process to actually decide what sort of content should be banned or should not be banned and secondly probably developing over this only can be about the fact that how efficient freedom of speech is also a concept in politics that when we talk about politics uh, or the amount of discourse that happens over there it cannot be simply limited to freedom of speech because otherwise you have this amount of inefficiency with politicians making random vague claims about each other which leads to nothing but simply bipartisanship in the entire uh, spectrum so to cure that what you need is much more intellectual and constructive discourse about actual matters and to ensure that you need politicians to stop making such statements okay um all right um others i think one thing that this debate would boil could boil down into is that who decides the steep platforming right um, like i think in last session also someone had mentioned how elon musk who owns um facebook is so biased oh, sorry um he's so biased towards the republicans right who wants to this is so biased towards republicans so like how this like not is is this deep platforming in its inherent form is very biased and that's wrong to like democracy right in a country okay so i think that would be the disagreement um with respect to this particular one because we are essentially asking who is the better actor to do so so who is the better actor to the platform um which one is more efficient since time time sensitivity is also very important which okay so you're saying what method of okay okay yeah developing over this only opposition can probably argue that the moment you let let's say one random politician not come forward with these um, racist claims that might actually be present in their policies coming forward you make sure that the entire community even though is protected from those claims isn't uh, protected from the impact of those claims this looks like donald trump still getting elected as a president of the united states of america and yet pushing out some let's say racist laws just because he's still a racist you just didn't know about it because these social media companies did something yep um sure so there is no transparency when it comes to um, so an extremist is always an extremist um even if it is social media I so i don't know query about this motion yeah. like who currently in the status quo decides mm -hmm. the platforming so i think it's based on the guidelines that social media has so it's independent yeah so it's right on the status quo social media companies only do it right yeah so they have a guideline so if you violate that guideline they can just but then i i've heard i've read like news where uh, the government essentially um request social media platforms a lot of times so they say that oh uh, rahul gandhi's account is probably not that great and then they're just like uh, a lot of like hate speech and stuff like that is there and then they just like suggest social media companies to remove it so again but it, it's the discretion of the social media company what suggestions can be okay um what do you think can be the disagreeing part so things like um with respect to what could be the the clashes in the debate where um, both sides are going to um say that look we established this but the both say that oh we do it better and then there's a clash so for example oh we think freedom of speech is better in, in proposition but then opposition says no freedom of speech is better than better in our city house um so just giving an example but what do you think is the disagreement Um, or disagreeing part of the debate. There are very political discourse because proposition would try to assert this main practical impact on their side. That hey, look, we're just making sure that there is efficient um debate happening on our side. Whereas opposition again can run the argument that look, you're having incomplete debate at your side. There's incomplete policies being told. so mm -hmm. that can probably be one of the points that what level of discourse also is the thing that you want that whether uh, unhealthy discourse at the public spectrum is making sure that people are able to elect out of something rather than elect into something okay so moving on to like what do you guys think is the 
way to resolve these clashes. So how do you think you would be able to prove? So you don't need to give me analysis, but just tell me the questions that you need to answer in order to prove that, look, in Asr of the House, um, social media, let's say, is a better actor to be platform. Probably if you're able to prove that social media companies are, let's say, motivated by consumer demand, we're mm -hmm. able to ensure that they are much more bipartisan in nature, irrespective, which is something that would not be present at opposition because it's being run by the government, which is the political party in a sense. So in that scenario, then we have fair decisions. Okay. So you first tell them that look, social media is essentially, um, so you, so I think there are different ways to do it. And this, there are different ways to prove that why social media is a better actor. So uh, I think it being uh, driven by consumer demand is one of the analysis to the linear dissection. So yes, it is driven by consumer demand and therefore they're more likely to cater to the consumers and cater to the safety of the consumers. So yes, you can do it by this. But then there is a general umbrella of term that you're supposed to uh, like justify. So that umbrella would look like um, defining as to what are the interests of social media in the first place. So one is social media obviously is determined or um, derived by consumer demand. Is there anything else do you think um, is like make social media a better actor? Think of the idea that like, what if this was given, how do you, what do you think the counterfactual is going to look like? Is it going to be government? Is it going to be some other body, independent body? What do you think it is going to look like? I think the counterfactual then exists for central governments so or let's say state governments trying to push forward the idea that this particular person should be banned. Then the very purpose of social media probably comes in that Facebook was established to connect people. And later on, as this platform has developed itself, it has made it a, it made itself an advertising position for a lot of brands, for a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. And that how this has made itself into a connective tissue for each and every person. And mm -hmm. in this scenario, then it becomes essential for it to actually work efficiently rather than to give itself this very power to let's say restrict individuals. I don't think the counterfactual and opposition would be. I think as like if I was opposition, what a counterfactual that I would propose is probably like election commission. Um, because political parties and if it's a political person, obviously, um, and it's somehow hurting a particular a campaign or like somehow spreading some sort of fake of fake news or like some sort of thing that is very radical in nature, then the election commission, um, a independent body like should have the right to do so instead of like a social media which can be biased. So you would say that an independent body is better. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you know what is the status quo with respect to election commission? In what context? So in context of like BJP and in context of the control that BJP holds on in, uh, in election commission, on election commission. On paper, it's supposed to like be completely independent. Yeah, yeah correct. So the, the problem with when you give the example of election commission, I think proposition can always come behind you and say that, look, um, even though it's theoretically independent, it's not necessarily independent, there's still like puppets of the central government and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a, um, that's a drawback there, but I think independent body running as a, a counterfactual is a good idea. Uh, but the point where I, what I was trying to make is that, do you see the difference? So I think one, what you're essentially trying to make like the binary is that look, one side is social media, other side is let's say two things, uh, independent body or the government, et cetera. But do you understand why a particular like thing is going to be like um, prioritized over the other is basis on the kind of whether which which body is biased or which body is more fair. So if you prove that social media is more likely to be fair and is more likely to be um, unbiased, I think you can still prove that, look, social media is a better actor. I think the counter to social media platforms can simply be about the corporate funding that they get. That let's say we have Facebook, they're getting this uh, amount of money from these republicans which are trying to make sure that their advertisements are on the top why would then facebook actually as a private entity take an active step to remove those profits that they're receiving yeah that counter still exists correct um but then you can always like counter that by saying what do you think would be the counter 
Also for social media, we can we can obviously come up here and say like, um, social media companies cannot like for example cancel a person like Narendra Modi, but they do have like they would cancel a person like Rahul Gandhi because of like the consumerist like a thing that there is around us, and then also like yeah. the power that um the government itself holds on social media platforms. That's actually a very good argument. So social media, because of the same analysis that proposition is going to use. saying that oh it is driven driven by consumer demand they're more likely to like listen to the majority demand meaning you're still like um like for like probably just supporting the majoritarian like view of the people and not necessarily giving the ability of people to express themselves as well yeah i think then what proposition can argue is that like even if let's say in the you know literally worst case scenario when you get you have extremist leaders coming forward which are let's say having a real high popular demand being put forward because this company is driven by consumerism then that's still correct on our side of the house because we think that what we yeah. want what we think is a social media company that is actually inclusive to all thoughts and yet making sure that it is representing the society as large we then think that it's a problem of the society rather than that of the social media company yeah so, that's to- true. so did you understand what is the essence of like answering these questions the winning argument is who can like characterize social media as a better actor or a bad actor the moment when you like like answer that question half of the debate is already won so how do you resolve that by defining or okay, characterizing the actor to be benevolent or bad cool second thing then i think there are two parts of this motion one is political uh, part and one is social media second part is about political discourse so what do you think uh, how can we resolve this i want actually like navya and all these people to speak as well arna do you think the same way how we have um characterized social media we can still characterize uh, politicians as well so you characterize why politicians are more likely to be good actors and why politicians are likely to be bad actors um so there are different ways to prove it but do you think it is a good strategy i think we can do that but right now maybe like since um we should also like focus a bit on the minority groups right in this motion because we haven't said anything about that and that can be like a very easy thing that a web speech can like a web speaker can bring up in their um final things okay fair enough so let's say this debate is also about the stakeholders who are the population so let's say social media politicians and then social and then population so let's come to the second part politicians and then tell me how you are going to like prove that politicians are bad actors let's start with the easy one why do you think politicians are bad actors um specifically on social media um, like their entire aim to be on social media is gather up propaganda for their own case um that's like one of the major reasons they're bad actors i think yeah. one of the reasons that could be said is that a claims made by popular and influential political leaders um can lead to a very extremist actions if they go ahead and make like a very rebellious statement against another person which could lead to like very extremist actions but also secondly um when then these politicians could also like say something that's very triggering in um in terms of um in terms of like ideology wise or political propaganda wise and that is why like to the masses that are listening to them that could just like be really really bad Okay. So two questions. One, why do you think people are going to likely people are likely to listen to politicians, and that's the second part of your analysis. So, um, sure, people are going to like it's going to lead to rebel re- like rebellion actions, but why? So I think it was yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, because like politicians. 
they hold a certain sub- amount of power and influence in terms of like for example um a bjp even though people don't know half the people in bjp they would still listen to like a, because like a person who's like very driven by like oh, a modi as like a figure they would most probably listen to a bjp minister talking about um how this particular thing happened and this particular muslim is bad and they would it would lead to like such extremist actions and such like rebellious statements and ideology that is obviously against social media's rules and regulations about like terming to like uh contain violence and contain like these statements that go and hurt against particular individuals and communities correct why do you think they're triggering that why they're more likely to make triggering statements um actually um can i just back up what pranshi said with something else that i wanted to add yes yeah, so i wanted to say was that this is one of the things politicians have social influence and they have media on their side but in developing countries like india people also don't have the exposure or the sort of, or a certain amount of information to not believe every single thing that they see on social media so it's not like you know it's not necessary for politicians to be good lies all they have to do is have influence on social media on their side mhm correct so they have political capital and they have a lot of influence meaning a lot of people see them a lot of people consume their data uh, consume their information and therefore are likely to uh, be impacted by it cool coming on to triggering statements why why do you think they are going to make triggering statements in the first place okay three reasons for oh yeah go ahead go ahead three yeah. reasons why okay <laughs> so um two key reasons again so first being uh, it's highly likely that they'll be able to get much support on their side of the house if they have this one community feeling a sense of protectionism towards itself that is to say the idea of right wing leaders majorly is to make sure that they're able to get the majority community believe that they in some way or, or the other a danger uh, a dangerous species in tarity so that means that it's highly likely they'll be able to make triggering speeches and yet gain a lot of support even if the minority does not agree with them their purpose is not to make the minority agree with them secondly it is again possible that they're able to let's say get support from various corporate bodies that actually work upon this extremist policy that is to say that when we talk about constituencies we able to they're able to garner that local support in a better fashion just because they're able to connect at a local level to connect at the roots of the people so if they're able to do that then they're also able to establish a higher voter bank for themselves correct connection and relatability and then also the idea of you know like division and to yeah priyanshi do you have any any reasons why any reason why okay so the reasons i think like politician would make triggering statement especially on a social media platform is because firstly a um a i think like this is like a very high relevant point but it is still like very relevant in like the real world in terms of like how politicians like don't really aren't really like that literate or aren't really like that like understanding about how you can't just say anything on social media but they just say what their ideology is but uh, secondly also um making these triggering statements also firstly sets their stance right um about what as like policy they want to like s- state right um and like this creates a sort of sense of vote bank when like i come on a debate and talk about how all muslims are bad for example um so as a, like i have to just gain like the for like those radical hindus to gain their vote bank they would all be like oh yeah that makes so much sense right so um so like for vote bank reasons but also to to like have this influence and have this attention towards them um because the moment that like they make such statements and they and at least a lot of debate especially like if you like look at all media platforms they debate the most irrelevant things ever um yeah. and some mostly like statements made by them and that will automatically lead them to gain more attention more like sort of influence over like people that agree with them even though like there are a lot of people that don't but it would still give them a vote bank over who they want to like influence yep i think that's pretty much it um it just is a political stunt a lot of times as well cool i think uh, with this we have finished this deck but let's see what i had when i prepared the deck um cool uh, could we have this document like maybe the link yes i am going to send you everything cool so i think in in terms of what i had in uh, in in regards to the clashes first expression of speech 
with respect to reasonable restriction? Second, is it a prefer preferable way to deal with the politicians? Do you think politicians are going to stop with respect to, you know, like saying anything um, um, on the platform? Third, whether politicians pose a large amount of threat, uh, meaning the impact that social uh, um, that that politicians' views um, essentially have on the people. Fourth, whether deplatforming politicians is essentially is going to like solve the problem or not. Problem being hate speech and stuff like that. And then lastly, whether is it okay to give this leeway to the social media companies um, independently? And I think independently essentially is a very like key term in this debate. Uh, moving on, I think I just like did not make it uh, or color coded. Uh, it for the sake of it because it's, it was looking like national flag versus like there is a recent mandate. So how to resolve these clashes? One, define as to who the politicians and what kind of discourse they indulge in. Second, what does the politician uh, why and how the population interpreted? And that's why that's where Navya's point come into picture. So why do you think uh, and how do you think politician uh, population interprets it? I think we have already covered the idea of minorities. We have covered the idea that people are sensitive. People are. Uh, like sensitive in terms of like their own community, they are, they have identity, and therefore like there has been several um, like uh, historical reasons as to why there are differences between two communities. So oftentimes than not, politicians use that difference to capitalize on their emotions and capitalize on their votes in and of itself. Fourth, then is there is there a difference in the way how freedom of speech of an individual or politician um, exists? So do you think there is a difference between individuals or when an individual actually makes a claim as opposed to when a politician makes the same claim? So I think um, like a lot of individuals, I think I have friends who are very extremist and like post stuff, which like all of the all of those examples that Priyanshi was giving. But then does it give like does it have the same impact as what let's say? Um, a, a random politician from BJP is going to make the same statements. So there is a difference with respect to the impact and why there is a difference of the principle of freedom of speech for these individuals and why it is difference in application as well. Then what is the responsibility of social media? What uh, what gives them the authority to remove politicians? Um, uh, that's also very important because it's a this house word question. So what you have to do essentially is also justify that why social media can do it in the first place. There are different reasons. One is based on the terms and conditions. So when you essentially open Facebook or um, Instagram, you, you accept the terms and conditions. So we don't like really, really read it, but the terms and conditions tell you that, look, these are the kinds of content that you can never post in, never engage in and stuff like that. Uh, my friend actually posted something about Jews um, and he got um, reported and I, he has his account but then it's still problematic. Yeah so I think there are a couple of reasons and a couple of ways how um, like people actually deal with this this kind of content in the first place and therefore like when you get like reported um social media companies try to make sure that you know that that particular amount of content is being removed why do you think social media companies essentially remove these this content in the first place um a general reason why it obviously affects like all of the users on the um, platform, right? And obviously, if they get a very, if there's like a very harsh statement, like one Priyarshi said, um, the Muslim, like, all Muslims are banned. Obviously, all the Muslims they'll get very offended, and they just they they can just leave the platform, right? That's so all. As a company, you owe to all the consumers, and you owe to give them, let's say, a healthy healthy platform to use it, and that's what most of the companies are supposed to do. If I'm using it, if I'm a consumer, you're supposed to like cater to my needs as well. Is there an, an, an alternative to solve the problem? Do you think um, so politicians can be controlled other way around? Do you think so? I think I've seen different ways of how people essentially deal with that. So, you know, like it's not necessary that you're supposed to always take the idea that look, social media companies are going to be the one deplatforming these politicians. Um, so I remember me, uh, I was taking the stance of like, look, we are going to penalize these individuals uh, by like proper justice system and rather than like you. Oh, I was also thinking that since politicians don't by themselves like manage their social media accounts, the, the, they obviously hire people who do it for them, right? So then now yes. they obviously have like training and stuff. So in that training, this can be taught. This is obviously like not a well thought out solution, just top of my head. But yeah. so I was thinking of like the idea of like justice system and the idea that look, you can report these cases and these cases should be like, let's say, given. Uh, more importance or these cases should probably be given um, like you know a fast track um, code or something of that sort that's what that was that that is what I ran when I was debating this argument is what I remember 
cool then let's move on to the forecasting and painting the picture so how do you actually paint the picture and why do you think it is important i think what it means when it when, it, when we talk about painting the picture is that essentially like if you are a person and you're reading a book you should be able to imagine as to what's actually happening so if you are a speaker and you're saying that this is how the world looks like i should be able to imagine let's say okay this is the world this is how the world looks like these could be the problems that could exist in this world and this could be the solution that could exist in this world so you should just like make it more easier for the judges to imagine what kind of world we are living in or what kind of world their motion is trying to portray it to us and then why this problem is probably going to be solved now the motion that we have right now is this house believes that black black lives matter movement should embrace open carry gun laws and engage in armed community patrols what do you think the status quo is like um so obviously like the status quo is a where the entire especially in the us the entire police system is filled with white individuals who necessarily just like there's so many cases where like they shoot black people for no absolute reason and think like if they're like even walking down the park at night they think that there's some sort of criminal and it just gives them this right to shoot at them um so i think like what proposition would run probably is like how this would give them firstly a sense of protection but also like would create like the sort of sort of sense where like the whites could not just like just like like just shoot at them but also opposition could be much stronger when they say that firstly just when you like get guns firstly these police people are trained for years right they and and okay so these black people who have done nothing they're carrying guns this white person just comes and who's who's a trained policeman right comes and tries to shoot them they would obviously even with guns won't be able to do anything so just like it just doesn't seem and also like it would create this negative sort of impact to the black lives matter movement itself because the interest of the movement is to like gain support and um for the black lives right however when you just allow that they should embrace open gun laws which would also obviously like have a lot of backlash for the black lives movement itself because the moment is um because a lot of people like do not support like gun laws right so it it does not like come into the interest of black lives matter to do that okay fair enough any um, other ways okay go ahead yeah just to take a few additional points to this first being that it's important to understand that which are the social groups that are supporting let's say gun laws and which are the ones that are not so it's most likely that left wing individuals would let's say try to be against guns and these are the same individuals that are going to vouch for equality for you then it becomes really difficult for these black uh individuals to actually gain any sort of support this can probably be indicated by the black panther group i'm i'm not sure if i'm saying the correct name which was That's present in, yeah cool so present in the 1960s uh which obviously went ahead and started this entire idea of military defense for black individuals but secondly then that it is important to understand that how are these individuals looked by different white people right so there is this one perfect white guy which believes in equality in the best way possible this person probably won't have an issue either way so this is the one person that is best case for both the sides then there is this mark then there is this like nazi I I hate black people. I'm going to shoot them, kind of guy. And we think that on both sides of the house, he's obviously a threat. What side then provides this person much more legitimization in pushing the idea of these black people as terrorists or pushing the idea of these black people as wrong individuals? It probably happens when they start carrying guns, when they start, you know, pushing any sort of aggressive agenda in front. And this then probably becomes very difficult for the white guy also to accept. thirdly then this looks like individuals that are actually trying to vouch for equality for both are not supporting either sides but are not trying to de-support one side also in case of any sort of military threat the moderates so you're right the moderates yeah the moderates would try to shift towards these white individuals again because they simply cannot be safe with the threat of this individual owning a gun at the very first instance but thirdly then that why does it fail as a movement at large it fails as a movement because 
black lives matter in a sense is a social movement trying to inculcate social indulgence social inclusivity of all races irrespective of color right the moment you try to add any sort of aggressive factor to it then the already existing ones which you're already saying are wrong then you create an automatic imbalance we do understand that the safety of black individuals is a priority that irrespective of the amount of social equality that is present in the society they need to be safe they don't need to die in this scenario still it is much more likely on proposition to uh, say, sorry opposition to make sure that they're able to let's say create a future of that sort by strictly leaning on the principle of uh, it being a social movement rather than converting in any form through any viewpoint as a military movement correct um with that i just want to like uh, take a moment to explain this uh template debate argument that is about um, that can be used in most social justice movements debate so it's about like demography of people and which people are likely to buy into your um, side so there are three kinds of people one is moderates one is extremists and one is liberals or leftists i think liberals and leftists are always going to make sure that your idea uh, that you know like you are essentially trying to make sure that you know like the uh, minority is always um supported but also like trying to make sure that the democratic uh, values and ideal ideals are still um, um still propagated and preserved uh but secondly there are extremists which are never going to buy into your movement whatsoever so if if you're if a person thinks that look i want to kill a black person they're never going to change simply because you gave them a good speech and stuff like that so they're never the people who you want to essentially attract into your arguments at all so they that they're the people who are this this argument of extremism of itself is like inexclusive so we don't think they're going to change in either side of the house the third thing then and these are the people who you want to like target as a debater so you're supposed to target the people who are moderate so they are on neither side and they can be convinced based on logic and based on the kind of convincing ability that you have so you give them the like the merits and harms of a particular thing and then they are going to like decide whether or not they support the movement or not so for example when um they told you about like look these people are the ones who are going to probably like buy into the movement so they are probably not going to buy into the movement simply because it it seems like a violent movement or it seems like most of the people are essentially against uh, like gun carry laws in the first place so this is what like the template debate argument of like demography of people actually looks like which can be used in whenever you are talking about whether a particular social justice movement should take a different stance um i i also want to give like a uh, like a an example of how um in feminist movements you have this um idea of whether feminist movement should be violent or not so whether feminist movement themselves should like take um arms and then try to make sure that like these perpetrators of sexual uh, sexual harassment should be killed and stuff like that so um this is where i think um uh, like the argument of uh, the same thing uh, i think like failure of state and all of that can can come into picture but we have a separate workshop for self feminism but i just wanted to like give an example of like gulab gang and how it can be similar to black panther group as well cool um then what did i have when i was speaking so slides so i had these things um what is the problem with the security of black community in america um there is police brutality there is high crimes and racist instigations there are there is structural oppression so all of the like analysis that you give essentially comes under these headings cool then what do you have in terms of defining and characterizing the things well first set the, the premise really clear so if you're saying that look blm is better than asad because you first need to tell us to what blm essentially is or what are the goals of blm what does blm actually look like all these things have to be clear otherwise you're just like debating in air and people just like judge does not know why exactly it's going to be there it's just going to be then based on the emotional value or emotional um, compass of the judge and that's why they're going to probably vote for you so it's always good to like first keep the premise extremely clear and they then go ahead and prove us to buy their better of enough idea so you cannot prove a thing based on an unproved thing in the first place so you cannot prove that blm is better than us said without proving as to what blm essentially stands for in the first place then i think a couple of things that you are supposed to like um, characterize the main actors first movement society um structural changes black community etc i think um there's also one more exercise for you um cool what do you think are the stakeholders of this debate black individuals first things first yeah second <laughs> second um the police surely the ones that are actually brutalizing these people thirdly um oh, black black. individuals okay um now where you can go next yeah go ahead oh yeah the, basically the people like in the company of the blacks like 
people of different colors obviously like whites brown it, they would come under black community yeah yeah so white would also be there right okay yeah you're saying that okay yeah the general society in white people yes sure they can probably again subdivide into white people as well based upon political opinions um what is probably the um law making i'm not sure about this argument though but if we um try to run the argument that let's say a particular government right now has an incentive to secure um let's say better treatment of black individuals by the hand of the police because they're being mistreated in the very first place but in any scenario then if the white black individuals believe that they are have to solve this on their own then what incentive or let's say what compulsion does this government have to come ahead and make sure that the system is verified yep that is true i think like um, often and not like these things could lead to um against lead against you for affirmative action lead lead um in support of affirmative action structural changes and policy changes so yes that is true um that could be one of the stakeholder government can also be one of the stakeholder um let's now come down and see why do you think they're the interest group of the debate like why do you think judge should care about it um and i'll i'll, I'll choose who will tell um arna mom i don't know the answer to this one sorry it's it's easy so just like think think through okay why do you think the judge should care about black community in the debate about blacks the judge should care about black community because it's a basic human thing to care about that but i don't see from a debate point of debate point of view no i don't see it okay you're saying that you should care about it because of human perspective that is fair okay but like think more in terms of um the judge being able to care about it so the the most things that okay are you had to say something i didn't say anything mom okay cool does anyone want to take a chance probably like you can bring up the equality argument right like everybody is should be treated fairly and all of that stuff um that is probably like main okay. main that is um something which arna also talked about in terms of like you just like a random human perception so i would club these both arguments and say that look it's universally accepted that you're supposed to like um you like respect the rights of individuals sure but also i think like for the judge to care we have to like picture a world in which like the black people are treated like brutally and how like the injustice towards them they like make the judge actually care about like how bad the situation is and that is why we should do something about it linking to the how bad the situation is i think what you're doing um, with respect to this motion is essentially proving why their situation is more likely to be better meaning you are proving delta of impact here meaning if a, if a particular community is already well off why should i care about their well being in the first place so why should i prioritize well being of one community over the other why do you think white supremacists are less prioritized over the like black 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 community so all of these things i think people have minority bias when they're judging but i don't think you should assume that minority bias and just go on and debate um i think and that's a very bad practice that judges just simply say that oh they're talking about minority and therefore i should accept that argument they should essentially prove that why we should care about minorities in the first place so the delta of change is extremely important and that delta of change is probably going to impact a lot of people can we also bring up like an example of the past like we can say that if we don't treat black properly basically history is going to repeat itself right um how you know how the americans tra- treated like blacks as slaves they got shipped from places to places there was such inhuman treatment of them um if this keeps if this continues and the same thing will happen again um that's probably like one more reason for the judge to care yeah in humane treatment cool um anybody else i think that somewhere the most common reason why all of these stakeholders are important is provided the impact that they have universally over the society that is to say that what happens when a vulnerable community or a minority in the society is not respected is probably bipolarity at its worst point whatever whatsoever and secondly humanitarian crisis and thirdly the idea that this vulnerable community and its interests are being exploited upon for the benefit of the majority which is principally not correct and then it becomes so much more essential for us to make sure that these institutions of the government are functioning properly just because they have this duty to function properly there is not an argument about that but secondly that 
okay you are a part of the society i do not care which part of the society you are from you do not have the right to kill someone just because you hate them you can hate them you can continue to dislike that person as an individual but for you to establish a structural system wherein you are trying to cut them off from the society is simply not valid and for that reasons why is with a which side and how is able to make sure that all of this positive equality is present becomes one of the most important things in the debate okay fair enough what do you think is the interest i just like wrote uh, whatever your answers were before welfare betterment justice i have a question yes um so in general like like with regards to this motion i can come up with like a lot of things for opposition but like what is like something strong that the proposition could run do you think all of it is so proposition like opposition no obviously not but like still i feel like a lot of it could be countered yeah so i think the first thing that he's supposed to do with respect to proposition is that uh, principally justifying as to why it is okay to do so and the way how he's supposed to do is based on um, the idea of state failure and i think i told you about the social contract theory and how like state has failed to protect black individuals so the fact that you know like police who's supposed to protect these individuals has failed to do so even if like years of like um, hard work years of movements and years of protest they haven't received the basic like rights in the first place um racist and like um all of these killings still exist mass killings mass killings and everything still exist meaning it is you you establish the urgency that look now the black community has to take up these things on themselves because a you care about your own community the government is not you care about your own people the government is not therefore you are supposed to take that like thing on yourself you're supposed to take that responsibility on yourself and then go ahead and let's say protect these individuals so at the end of the day if my child um I, if I'm a block from the black community and my child is doing okay um, and isn't being killed by a random police in like officer, I think it's it's a win a win 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 situation. And then go on to say that why there the situation is worse off inside opposition, no changes whatsoever, um, and all of that. That's how um, you can do a good prop and but, all this like, layers of analysis. But then like, what if I as like opposition I come up here and say like, hey, um, having guns doesn't necessarily mean that you'll now suddenly be protected from police people because firstly, police has like years of training, right, which automatically gives them an advantage. But also secondly, when you take the law in your own hands, for example, let's say for your own protection, you, um, a police officer who's just being acting really brutally to you, you try with the help of gun, you injured them or like that would essentially come under like police harassment, which can have you like. a lot of jail time because that's how the narrative would be essentially set in this like dominated world so that would just just make them like be better off and be like played instead of being played uh, instead of being like the victims there they'd be played the um okay the people who are guilty so, so argument to that would be basically this proposition can come up and say that look now that we are saying that uh, the community or the movement of itself is embracing open carry gun laws it's not going to be individuals actually like com- community it is community patrol right which means a large number of people co- like patrolling together and then like uh, and it's also like based on the place that we are there living in for example if it is a particular society um they are going to probably like put like patrol around it which means that a large number of black individuals are probably staying together they have like some amount of integrity and unity and stuff like that meaning if then your um trained police officers are going to come it's then going to be considered as a genocide which is highly highly um like depreciated by like university then you can like go on like ha- and have more accountability metrics and more call out mechanism and then say that why it is unlikely to happen because um you like you know united states of america does not want to be portrayed as a government which is against minority or like anyone for that matter they're just like very diplomatic in the stance as well oh okay um, that's another thing to this if i may yeah, yeah, yeah. go on. Yeah, so the thing that I was thinking for as a counter to um, what Priyanshi just said was probably this weird assumption that hey, just because you are carrying guns now, somewhere else, these institutions have a lesser responsibility towards you, right? So, for example, in a country that is that has legitimized carrying guns, why does it become so much more worse of when a vulnerable community starts to do the very same thing? So, for example, if USA has given you the right to carry um, weaponry around. why does it become wrong if black individuals are starting to do it and isn't it then reflecting on the very problem in the institution because if today white individuals started to push forward these um let's say gun parties in a random square or in a random park no one would raise, raise a question but just because it is done by a community that is actually under threat 
it becomes a question. But secondly, then we can probably run the argument from the proposition that irrespective of the amount of social movements that you're doing, we simply can see that they're not working, right? You've been fighting for these simple rights from 1960s or let's say from the 1900s actually at that, and you haven't achieved much. In that scenario then, why does it become so much more important for you to kill another hundred black individuals just in the hopes of running into something, running into some sort of solution to the social equality? Because even if the police doesn't do something, we can still believe that KKK can run random marches in Minneapolis tomorrow and then they can kill another hundred individuals. And in that scenario, then it becomes so much more important for these black individuals to protect themselves. So we're not running the argument that they're actively going to enter into a police station and kill someone. We think that in itself is a crime, but for them to use it as a defense purpose when the government has allowed you to do so is not wrong. But secondly, in countries wherein gun laws are, let's say, not present, right? Like, let's say there are background threats, you're not allowed to have guns. This is this can probably be for more European countries at large. In this scenario, then it still becomes essential because A, protection of oneself, B, social contract has already broken again the entire argument that is said, and C, that if you do not want the social contract to be broken, then start acting uh, more, let's say, purposefully towards these vulnerable communities. So we can probably then push a little bit that the moment the police becomes more active, the moment the police becomes a much more legitimate actor in this entire situation, we'll stop these marches. So a leverage for this community to make these people work in the very first place, which is probably essential and which cannot happen through elections simply because they are the minority, even their votes don't matter at the end of the day. Yeah. Priyanji, do you still think it's biased, Moshu? No, it's it's fine. Okay, let's just go on to why do you think it is? So I have come up with this argument that it is likely to reduce crime against black community. Now you come up with reasonings as to why it is necessary, like possible. One thing, deterrence. Okay. Secondly, probably again, responses of communities. So how I'm trying to picture it over here is that irrespective of the amount of weapons that a person is carrying, what does it signify? What is the principalistic message that is going outside? And that can probably be a symbol for every, let's say, international government also that this one government is not able to protect its own population. So we can say political pressure from external factors, A. B, also there can be some sort of moral grounds that the government now needs to stand itself upon to make sure that these communities itself, this entire country is not dividing itself up. So to, let's say, have a much more united form of patriotism they want these people to stand together but see if any sort of community starts to pause any sort of threat to you then the immediate argument that you have is to make sure that they demilitarize in that scenario then again the leverage that the black individuals have but the the amount of discourse that they'll be able to participate in automatically because hard power at the end of the day does lead to some amount of soft power so when i say hard power it doesn't mean that they'll start shooting legislators or let's say push push guns over legislators heads and say that listen to us right now read this letter or otherwise we're going to kill you this means that they're just going to have a much more prominent say they're going to be represented as a much more prominent community that can actually stand for itself something that is not happening in the status quo simply because government institutions are not standing with them this looks like a black individual still not being able to let's say feel free or feel safe in a protesting mass because they know they'll be much more they're much more likely to be heard by a police individual in comparison to a white male standing beside them in this scenario then it becomes so much more important for them to shield themselves from all these ideas and to be much more inclusive uh, inclusively a part of the society even if people won't let them be a part of society. Fair enough. Um, going back to Navya. It would also sort of like unite the black community together, right? Since like they commonly are facing like a tough, tough thing and then there's a solution which you're bringing across. So that sort of unites everybody together and then collectively you can like create protests and stuff that, ha- that ensure that the government listens, right? Yes, fair enough. Arna, Priyanji, do you have anything to add? I would assume that as no then, and then move on to what I had in the 
presentation. Um, I actually need to go now. So um, are we going to be discussing anything else? Yeah, I think there are like a couple of more things. Um, and I'll just try to finish it up in like 10 minutes. Okay, so I think we already discussed why do their interests matter in the debate and what impacts does the judge need to buy. So firstly, um, I think, and, and all of it is like already being discussed in, but like identify the problem first and then go on to establish as to why like the problem is extremely important. What? Go to the previous slide. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. So I think with respect to social media company, I think there are a couple of ways how you can do it, like the same uh, portion. First, there is fake news, there is instigation, hegemony uh, by the platform, hegemony of the platform by the political for the political gains, misleading population, cutting off extremism. I think I've also added like few of the facts, like you know, how people started like cutting off extremism from social media. So 2016, cutting off ISIS influencers, then prevention of info wars, like what happened in COVID-19, hate speech 2017, Reddit removed users which had tendency to show uh, all of that bad stuff but then like also having trump being banned was the epic movement 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 by twitter and then um alternative platforms do you all, do you all are you aware of like these alternative platforms for extremists so there is something called as um eight chan and parlor so how what okay yeah sneak you were saying something um, yeah, I'm aware about the fact that there are basically conspiracy theory channels where some random individuals come up with things and they try to spread it. But secondly, they way too closeted as well. That is to say that they don't exactly allow various people to come in. And yeah. these are very... Um, Hush <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they basically like, um, they would start their movement on these uh, mainstream platforms like Twitter or um instagram no i don't think instagram facebook necessarily and then what they would do is like okay they would see these are the people engaging in my post these are the people who are commenting on my post the most and then they would make these smaller circles where it gets extremely toxic where you when let's say you join parlor or you join um hn i think um then there is like a more amount of like extremism that is like literally in the like inculcated in individuals which is extremely problematic so the I, argument behind that is look if you are going to stop these individuals from these uh, like uh, mainstream platforms it's going to be extremely difficult for you to track down these individuals for the same reasons reason, reason as to what snake said it's difficult to like enter these platforms in the first place and therefore less accountability and stuff like that so it's okay for them to be um outright in front of everybody so that you can track them down and then um track the kinds of like harm that are going to be created as opposed to having them in the smaller niche circles where you cannot track down their activity whatsoever um and whether or not it's going to solve the problem then um, things to note, and these are things extremely important. I think I've already mentioned as to why that is the necessary case. First is that while defining the stakeholders, you cannot assume a particular party to be good or bad. So when you say that, look, politicians are always supposed to be good and stuff like that. And then you say that politicians are always supposed to be bad. So I don't think we like discussed on the idea of why politicians are supposed to be good, but essentially how you can do it, like just briefly is based on like how there is voting mechanism. They always want people to like them. They always have like call, uh, like call out mechanism, mechanism and so on and so forth they have to they have a party image to maintain stuff like that so all of these things are extremely important for them as well so it's again about weighing and stuff like that so give reason as to why a particular act is likely to be good or likely to be bad as opposed to assuming that oh politicians are bad or oh politicians are good that these are simply assertions so if you see anyone doing it from the next time just question them on that then framing and counter framing is extremely important for you in, in uh, argument so when it comes to framing and counter framing it's just simply this when proposition frames that uh, politicians are good actors you counter frame them by saying that look politicians are not good actors in the first place and that helps you to build up your arguments later so uh, by I think I've already given reason why it is good or bad. Now, which argumentation to run? I think it's um I think people have the tendency to say that look, I want to be proud of the case that I make and therefore I would run the complex cases. That's not how like debates actually work. If you are going to run complex cases, the, you need to like do more like work in order to prove that argument in of itself. Meaning, in order for you to explain that argument to the judge of itself, you're going to like spend more time. You're going to spend more time in terms of like just defining the terminology that you're actually telling the judge to. And if you don't do, the, do so, the government, like the judge is never going to buy that, right? Meaning it's okay to run the most obvious arguments if in case you're able to like have better reasonings as to why it is like going to be uh, like used 
the best way or how you have more analysis to it. So use simple arguments, but high level of reasoning. That makes that takes me to the um, uh, concept of linear dissection of reasoning, meaning you can have different reasonings to one argument. So when you say that, look, this is my argument, rather than having a generic reasoning, reasoning give reasonings in layers, so like tell why it is good for these many reasons. Um, it's always attractive to say that five reasons why, but also gives more like layers of analysis to your case as well, and therefore gives more understanding as to like, okay, if not this reason, if you don't buy this reason, let me give you three more reasons to believe that thing in the first place. So um, if you see this house regrets growing pre prevalence of poverty porn, um, you can come up with the idea that, look, it leads to more donation, and then go ahead and say that, look, why it is the case. One, empathy. Two, it's going to have more reach to the individual. People are more likely to consume that kind of content. But third, it's going to lead to, aware, like lead, like lead to awareness and stuff like that. So all of these things are essentially very important rather than just like you saying that, oh, look, it leads to donation and then stopping it there. So have linear dissection of reasoning and then tell, look, these are the reasons as to why I believe so, what I believe so. Cool. Moving on to the layers of analysis, then I think there are like more examples as to how you can learn it. And I think we have already discussed one um, as to why we think uh, crimes essentially reduce. So I have given reasons as to like because the back community, um, there's more relativity and therefore there will be more support. Secondly, safety and number of calling out racist police. I think people of people who are going to be calling out like police being racist is going to be increasing. Um, there's also more comfort and uh, trust in the community. Therefore, like they're going to be feeling com comfortable that look, I can probably sleep tonight because I think that somebody out there is patrolling for me and nobody like it can like come come in my room and like kill me suddenly and that's the kind of like threat which is extremely bad for like several reasons and then go on to say that look it's going to make people for, feel more protected and safe and why like protected protect, protection of itself and safe is good um i think for morality reasons for philosophical reasons for but also for productive reasons as well like how can you be a productive individual how can you like probably focus on your studies focus on your you trying to like fill in a job application when you have constant threat of like death in the first place. Again, deterrence, which I've already talked about in transmission to policy, policy changes. Um, I also want to like give more analysis on this part, this, this part where like um, impact and shock level. I think we don't give enough uh, emphasis on the idea that look, look, it is WSDC and mannerism and articulation is extremely important, meaning have clear speech and people should be able to understand what you're speaking, have hand gestures, but also have persuasiveness. So sell your arguments to the judges, um, try to make it look fancy, but not fancy to an extent that the judge can also not understand it. So uh, the argument, the motion that I've used in this house supports pop feminism. Um, I hope you all understand what pop feminism is, um, but essentially like not like, um, in like pop, pop feminism is basically not um, recognizing the idea that like there are structural problems, but just simply like going with the flow and like thinking that look, people are someday going to realize that female and males are equal. So um, how essentially you go on and have the impact to it. So basically the way how you can have the impact of this particular debate is like proving to the judge that look, changes from the feminist group and women is possible. And then first establish through why the problems that are there in the first place. So these are the small terminologies which can have a lot of impact in your speech when you're having the first, like when you're presenting your first speech, then rebuttals for the speakers. I think um, Anishka had this question uh, but since she did not join, but like I just wanted to say that like rebuttals for the first speaker is not necessarily like targeted rebuttals. Obviously, if you think of particular arguments, it's like so obviously, uh, so obvious that it can be rebutted on the get go, do it, but don't spend more time on rebuttals whatsoever. So if you're a first speaker, don't spend more time than two minutes on, on rebuttal. Two minutes is like max that you should spend, meaning your actual like weapon as rebuttal is counterframing, which I said, uh, when you counterframe that, what are the actual actors? When you counterframe, what is the actual problem? When you counterframe, why essentially that's not the solution? That essentially take the they on the entire case, and that's the weapon that you are supposed to use as a rebuttal for for speaker. Then give counter analysis, obviously, and have integrated rebuttals. When you have integrated rebuttals, you uh, less, spend less time as to like why it's problematic but you spend more time as to like telling that look, yes, it's problematic, but I'm also going to prove my own case. The reason why you should spend more time in proving your own case is that because it's first speech. And if it is only going to be a negative like, speech, it's going to have less impact, less shock level on the judges. It's just going to like not look that great. But also like the second speakers don't have the lot of, like a lot of amount to just simply deal with the positive case. Um, and oftentimes they're not, if you're DLO, it's going to be consider considered as DLO dumping. So don't do that at all. Um, 
and then you have the rebuttals for first speakers. Do you want to do, like do this activity because I think we're going up, up, off the, like way ahead of time. So I can just like quickly go over it rather than like you all telling me how this is going to work. So so the way how it's going to work is that um, this house believes that police commissioners should be directly elected. There are different clashes. Um, whether this is better way of upholding peace in the society, which side is going to have better police commissioners, which is the better way to reform the system, and why is it intrinsically effective? Then there are different ways how you can have uh, rebuttals. So um, how do you resolve it is the way how you can uh, come up with the answers to the rebuttal. So when I said to you, when I told you that like, you know, in the 10 minutes, you're supposed to come up with questions and then um, like the, uh, the problems in terms of the disagreement, which is a clash, and then come up with how you're going to resolve the clash. That's essentially is going to give you the rebuttals. Meaning, if your if proposition is talking about favoritism by government, opposition can talk about merit based appointment. Uh, for example, India. If proposition is talking about direct uh, talking about direct accountability, opposition can talk about indirect accountability and why it is better. If proposition is talking about system and checks and balances, opposition can talk about why it is necessary that there is cooperation between the government and the police. Police and therefore, um, when when government essentially appoints the police, there's more uh, cohesion and more changes in terms of implementation of society as well, of the policy as well. Then importance of elections, opposition can say, oh, election can be fine, but it can also be burdensome for people, for people who are like probably living in villages, it can be problematic for them to essentially like go and like vote for every single thing, specifically when they are, when they are like having jobs, which is essentially tiresome for them and their labor, like laborers and so on and so forth. Then voter base is sincere when you say that, oh, people know how to vote and stuff like that. And opposition can say that, no, voter base is impulsive and inaccessible and then inclusivity of society that proposition can talk about and opposition can say that look um you say that it's going to lead to inclusivity of society meaning you're like putting these people um uh, and like putting the onus on these people and saying that look you can actually go ahead and elect your commissioners however what it essentially does is the opposite meaning you the access to the to the idea of voter base is extremely less meaning you increase more inequality in the society so the people who actually decide as to who is going to be the police commissioner is going to be the individual who had the ability to vote is going to be the individual who who had so much money that he could like take away those working hours and come to the voting uh, place in the first place Cool then, um, because we did not discuss a lot of like uh, motions, I still want you all to like read these um, like um, articles. They are very small and very interesting. So you can talk, uh, like read about cancel culture, deplatforming, pop feminism, it's all pretty good. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Stop assuming, start proving. So it's about like how politicians say, ah, things are bad or good. Just don't say that, like prove that. And that's how you win the debate. I have a link of the document with the characterization. Yeah, I'll send you every single one. Okay. Cool then. Um, thank you so much for joining. And uh, if you guys have any questions, you can ask. And you can also give.